All right, well, welcome back. Uh, and uh, today, what we're going to do is continue our discussion from a little while ago about evolution. And uh, last time uh, that we talked about evolution, uh, we talked about microevolution, the idea that changes in things like bacteria, perhaps, over short periods of time could genetically change as a group. And what we're going to look at now is is macroevolution taking that same principle if you can get changes genetically in say bacteria or small organisms over say a you know week or month or five ten year period what happens if you accumulate those changes over long periods of time ten thousand years a million years and the idea there is that um, if you could uh, look at that what would the evolutionary changes look like over a long period of time? And I guess in the idea of macroevolution, large changes over relatively large amounts of time. And there are experiments now that are being set up to test these types of things over a long period of time. But right now, the only thing we can really do is, is look back into the past and see if that model fits um, other things that we saw from um, Darwin's theory of evolution from uh, the the start uh, of life, for example. So we're just going to mention a few of these here today and, and give you only a few examples because there's a lot. But we're going to talk about fossils, uh, for one, how we can look at the fossil record and what we can do with that. Uh, radioactive dating, so we can measure uh, about maybe when those organisms lived. And then how we can use things like molecular comparisons and morphological comparisons to suggest that maybe two organisms are related to one another. And the first thing I'm going to talk about quickly here is just uh, how, how a fossil would be made. And there's actually many different types of fossils, but but uh, one one way we can look at it is this, let's say you have an organism in the past that's alive, like in this case a snail. And then uh, at some point the snail dies. And to make fossils, uh, certain uh, types of things have to happen to make a fossil. So not everything that lives makes a fossil. So there's sort of a, what we call it that the habitat uh, bias. There's certain habitats that are better for making fossils than others. So what happens is that over time as this animal's died, in this case uh, it's died in some shallow body of water. And so what ends up happening is you get um, these sediments depositing over the organism over time and as the sediments deposit all the minerals in the organism are replaced with the sediments um, from the dirt and soil and you're left with a fossil and then some type of geological uplifting could bring this back to the surface and then we could find it and, and, and examine it. And there are many fossils like this trilobite here for example is one. There's just literally tens of thousands of fossils of different organisms and we can often look at maybe how old they are and so forth. One of the things you often hear uh, people say is well you know what about human fossils you know and, and it turns out there, there's this is just a, a few of the many if you go to you know google images and type in human fossils and click on the the images tab you'll see this tremendous variation in human fossils here's here's a couple that they found for example in, in the fossil record that were apparently either buried or died together and we find you know sometimes we find partial skulls and you can put that together and and, and try to imagine you know what those look like uh, so there's, there's many fossils of humans as well as other organisms um, over time and and sometimes you don't have uh, the organism sometimes you do but the other things you can get for example it's a famous uh, thing called the Latoli footprints uh, where they found um, basically what they believe is an upright walking human with two feet, you know, seeing here. Uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, uh, there was another set of footprints. So they think this is a, like an adult walking with a child. So sometimes you find impressions um, that are from the past as well. The other thing we can do is, is not only look at the fossil and, and sort of compare it, uh, but we can do what's called radioactive dating. Um, and, and I'll give you an example here of carbon-14 in this case. So carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon. If you remember back to week one, an isotope 
is a molecule that has uh, same number of protons and, and electrons, but carbon-14, for example, differs from carbon-12 and the number of neutrons it has. Okay, so those are isotopes. And what happens is carbon-14 is unstable and will tend to break down over time. And so what happens is your carbon-14 will break down over time. And, and so you, you expect this certain amount at 100% when your animal dies. And then over time, since carbon-14, we believe, has a stable half-life of about 5,600 years, after about 5,600 years, if you measure the amount of carbon-14 compared to carbon-12, uh, you find that the amount of carbon-14 you have relative to carbon-12 has changed such the ratio now is you have about half of that. And that takes, for you to lose half of it, it takes 5,600 years, which leaves you with, if you notice in this picture here, you have half left. So another 5,600 years, and this, is, this, this confuses people a lot of times, but... It's like, well, this piece is smaller than this piece. But what happens is that it's the rate of decay. So the rate of decay, the chance that a carbon-14 molecule is going to decay stays the same. So the idea is it takes about 5,600 years for roughly half of your molecules to decay. So you always have to look. It's always half of what's left. So coming in here next... In another 5,600 years, you're going to lose half of that piece, is the idea there. Um, so over time, let's go back to that. So in another 5,600 years, you would lose this chunk. And if you put that, if you add that to that, then you get something like 16,800 years. Um, and carbon-14 is only good to about 50,000 years, meaning a fossil that's older than that, there's not enough carbon-14 left to really measure how old that fossil is. But uh, there's other ones we can use, like there's potassium-40, I believe it is, and there's uranium-238, for example. These have half-lives of you know 10 to 20 billion years or something like that i can't remember the number exactly right now but but those aren't found in the organism but rather the rocks so sometimes you can measure the fossil itself or you can measure the rock around it and what we find by looking at the fossil record and by comparing all these organisms we find that throughout the fossil record uh we can develop this sort of history of the world Okay, a history of life uh, on the planet and fossils we find it and how things changed over uh, periods of time. And we break them down into these categories, mainly when there's big changes in the fossil record. So what we're going to focus on in this class is just the eras here, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and the Precambrian. Uh, and then sort of some of the, the events that uh, happened at the end of those. So these are our four big eras, we call them, uh, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and Precambrian. And th this over here shows you sort of some of the basic things that have happened uh, over those periods of time. Okay, And I'll just give you one example here. Um, when you're in elementary school, most people learn uh, about what happened during the Cretaceous extinction okay, or about 65 million years ago. This is when most of the big dinosaurs went extinct. And so in the fossil record, we find all these fossils that all date back, you know, roughly to about 65 million years, Tyrannosaurus rex and Brontosaurus and all these big dinosaurs you learn uh, in elementary school. And we notice they're not around anymore, but many of those disappeared right about that time. And so what we believe happened in that case is that there was a large meteor that hit the earth. That meteor created a cloud of dust, probably also landed in a shallow pool uh, of uh, ocean, shallow ocean uh, in Mexico that had fairly large amounts of sulfur on the bottom. That probably blew sulf sulfur up into the air and therefore created um, like acid rain with sulfuric acid. And so the combination of the dust uh, and uh, the sulfuric acid probably made uh, a drastic change in the environment 
which led to the demise of most of the big dinosaurs at that time. And everybody kind of learns about that one, but uh, pretty much all of these, the Precambrian uh, right here, uh, the right right in here at the end of the Precambrian, and the Permian, sorry, the Permian is what I meant, uh, the Permian, so the end of the Precambrian, the Permian extinction, all these are periods of time where what we see in the fossil record is there's a whole bunch of organisms of one type, and then those sort of sort of disappear, and they're replaced with very different looking species. So we believe that what happens is there's these large um, changes, um, large changes that occur in the environment uh, of some sort, and that leads to the extinction of a lot of those species. And then what's left, you get what they call adaptive radiation, where there's all these new open habitats where organisms start to occupy those new areas. Now, uh, we can also compare the past by looking at things uh, like homology and analogy. Uh, homology, homology simply means we're looking at that two things have a shared evolutionary history. So the idea, for example, of a gorilla and a bat, you have two very different looking organisms here, but both of them are mammals. They have hair, uh, they feed their young, uh, they give live birth, for example. Um, and if you look at the forearm of a gorilla and that of a bat, they look quite different. But if you look at their bones, you find a lot of similarities. So uh, the birds, I mean, sorry, the bat's wing, for example, although it's used for flying and, and is quite different on the outside. If you look at the bones, their bones are quite similar in their structure. Like they have, for example, the first bone being the humerus of, of both of those. And then there are two bones after that, not one. Uh, there's not two bones here, for example. They have a very similar structure in terms of how they were built. They've been modified probably by evolution for flying and for uh, you know, walking, for example, or picking things up. Uh, analogy, we have to sort out when we compare things, if two things are analogous or not, or examples of analogy, because that simply means they have a similar function. So for example, an insect, an insect does fly. And if you, if you think, well, a bat and an insect therefore are related, well, they, they don't share similar flying characteristics. They fly for different reasons. Uh, a bat flies using its front arm, essentially. But an insect, uh, like, uh, say, a butterfly, its wings actually grow like out of its back. So it's analogous because they have a similar function, but they probably evolved independently. They're unrelated to each other. Then the, uh, one of the final things we can talk about is that if you take all of these species and you look in the fossil record at when they appear and you compare the um, homology by looking at the bones, for example, you can develop these cladograms. And these cladograms are charts that depict the evolutionary relationship of organisms. So for example, um, in this case here, placental mammals, which is like us and rabbits and other things like that, are probably related to other mammals. Um, we, you know, we give live birth uh, most of them have a placenta. There's a few examples here you notice that are a little bit odd, like the marsupials, the kangaroos, and the monotremes, like the duck-billed platypus. They are mammals, but they're a little bit different than most mammals you're used to. Whereas snakes and lizards and birds, those are quite different from mammals. So we can compare the bones of those things. We can also look at the DNA. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, what they've done is independent of the DNA. They're using um, this, they're u I mean, independent of the morphology. Instead of just looking at the bones and structure, what if you looked at the DNA of these things? And it turns out, in this case, they're looking at uh, cytochrome C oxidase. So one of these uh, enzymes involved uh, with metabolism, and they're comparing, say, a human and a pig and a duck and a snake, and they're looking at how different that enzyme is, how many differences are there. And so, for example, between a human and a yeast, the number of differences is there's 66 differences in that gene. The number of differences between a human and a moth is 36. 
a human and a pig, there are 13 differences. So uh, if you look at the structure of the DNA, okay, the idea here is what we find is if we look at the structure of the DNA, and there's a lot of organisms they didn't put on this chart, which is okay. They just put, you know, certain ones. But it turns out that the DNA differences and similarities very closely match what you find in the um, homology of the bones, so comparing the bones. So what we find is if you put all this data together, there's very good evidence that life is related to other life forms, both in their shape and in the fossil record and in their DNA. And so we find this very, not not a hundred percent consistency, but I would say, you know, pretty good, you know, probably in the order of 95 percent uh, consistency uh, when we look at all the different forms of life, compare their structures and compare DNA uh, and the fossil record. It all sort of comes together in one nice picture for the most part.